the Lax Factor Podcast. What is up, College Across fans? You're watching episode 275 of the Lax Factor Podcast. I am your host, Ted Hoost, and today we're going to talk about a bunch of the games that are being played this weekend. We're going to start it all off with uh, number four, Maryland, traveling up to Syracuse and uh, to play Syracuse in the Carrier Dome. Uh, that's going to be the big game this weekend, number four versus number five. But we're also going to dive into number three, Richmond, or number 17, Richmond, uh, playing number three, Virginia. We're going to look at number seven, Army, number 11, Rutgers, number 20, Loyola versus number nine, Hopkins. So we actually have a bunch of solid games between ranked opponents this weekend. Before I dive into all of that, as always, be sure to like, subscribe, and then share the crap out of the podcast with your friends. That's really all I ask of anyone. And you can always go to laxfactor.com and support us that way even just by watching the videos there, by visiting the site, or uh, by buying some swag between, you know, a beautiful beer mug uh, or a, let's see here, we got t-shirts, t-shirts galore, baby, Club Lacrosse All-Stars, Band of Brothers t-shirt, Garden Gnomes t-shirt. We even got a stupid yellow smiley face that my daughter made me do because she said smiley faces were cool. I actually don't know if anyone's purchased uh, the yellow smiley face t-shirt yet, but pretty much everything else uh, you know, they people dabble, and I thank everyone for supporting us that way. And that is it. We are going to shut up now, and I'm going to talk about Syracuse and Maryland. Now, I presume most consider this game the game of the week. Uh, it's the two highest-ranked teams facing off against each other on the weekend. With Syracuse, you're going to get a healthy dose of motion on offense, tic-tac-toe passing, and it, one of the most efficient offenses in the land. The Orange boast right now the sixth most efficient offense in the nation per lacrossereference.com. Joey Spolita put up 26 points over Syracuse's first three games, but they haven't faced a defense anywhere near as solid as the Terps are going to put on the field here. Uh, one of the surprises, I think, is how how well o Owen Hiltz has played considering all the new depth. I, I keep saying over and over I was afraid Hiltz might get a little bit lost in that shuffle. The opposite has been true. He's had an incredible season so far. Um, so that he, Spelina has lots of help is the moral of the story here. If we're comparing offensive units, which of course I'm going to do, for the first time in a long time, I'm going to go with Syracuse. They have quite a bit more proven talent, largely just because of the transfers that came in. Even if much of that talent is young, the transfer veterans that they brought in between Moulet, Jake Stevens, and uh, Sam English, enough cannot be said about them. And then you get into Cone and the rest of them, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, Maryland overall hasn't been great offensively in their first two games. They come in currently ranked 24th in offensive efficiency. However, their first two opponents have been Richmond and Loyola. Both are likely better than anyone that Syracuse has faced yet, so these numbers could be a little bit misleading. I'm sure Maryland's offense really isn't 24th in the nation, uh, but because they've played two teams right now that are both very good defensively, which we'll talk about later, I think that drags their number down a little bit. So I don't think Syracuse's offense is leaps and bounds better than Maryland's. I think they're going to be a little bit more efficient. I think they do have a little bit more proven talent, but that does not mean that Maryland, that they don't have the dogs necessary uh, to come into the dome and to you know upset and beat someone up here. Uh, so offensive uh, edge goes to Syracuse in this one. Defensively, Absolutely no question, all Maryland. The Terps' defensive personnel is superior. They've got Ajax Zapatello leading the way. Syracuse doesn't have an actual All-American on the field defensively other than Mark in cage, and Maryland has potentially the defensive player of the year running around for, for them, and his line mates are not far behind him. Very deep defensively in terms of the, the talent that they have that they put on the field at all times. The edge defensively, so that goes to Maryland, no no question. They're currently ranked number one in defen defensive efficiency for a reason. They're stacked all over that, that side of the field. And even better for the Terps, they're not, right now they're ranked number one in defensive efficiency, and they've played two very good teams in Richmond and Loyola that have both proven – Against Maryland, they struggled offensively, but against other teams, they did not. So Maryland right now defensively could have, the, you know, statistically speaking, right now they do have the best defense in the land, but I think that's going to hold up through the season, and I think Maryland's defense is going to probably finish the season top three almost for sure. So huge edge to, to Maryland defensively. But I think that when you put the Maryland defense against the Syracuse offense, Syracuse's offense is efficient enough and they turn the ball over little enough that I think that's a that should be a really good battle. 
that goes down there. Now, at the face-off, oh, in cage. I want to talk about in cage next. So if we kind of dive in here and we look at the goalie battle that we're going to see, Will Mark in cage and Logan McNaney in cage, both very good goaltenders. Logan McNaney sitting at 63% after their first two games, looking a lot better than Will Mark's save percentage at this point, but don't front on Mark. Mark is a gamer, and uh, he will make big stops for the Syracuse defense. You hear it a lot where people like to put – the success of a goalie completely on the goalie. And in the same sense, people want to put the lack of success for a goalie completely on the goalie, similar to how you would see it with like the quarterback position in football. The The problem with that is that a goalie's success is going to be greatly tied to the defense that's in front of him. And, you know, does that defense give up easy shots? Does that defense contest shots? Uh, a team like Virginia, I think, is pretty much – relatively doomed to always have a goalie with a save percentage below 60% because they press everyone all over the field. They, they, they drive fast and they take a lot of chances and that's going to put your goalies in positions at times that are difficult for them to make a stop. But that does not mean that that goaltender isn't capable in a different defense of putting up a 60% plus save percentage. So Maryland has that defense. You put a, you put any good goalie in front of that defense, they're going to be above 50%. You put a kid like Logan McNaney in front of that defense, he's going to be able to hang by the end of the season in that area of the high 50s, low 60s in terms of his save percentage. So uh, edge, I, I wouldn't give an edge in the goalie battle out, outside of the fact that McNaney is going to be set up to have a slightly better save percentage, but Will Mark is absolutely going to make stops that he shouldn't for his defense. And that that I call that one kind of a wash, depending on who gets hot. You know, and, and in the end, whoever wins the goalie battle, I think, will win this game. So I think whatever, if if one of these goalies greatly outplays the other, ball game. You know, these two teams are too closely matched. I think at this point for that to not play. So I think that this game is going to come down to the goalie battle, and then even more importantly than the goalie battle, I think this game is going to come down to the faceoff dot. We know what Maryland has in Luke Weirman. They've got a guy who's starting his third season of being one of the big cats, one of the best faceoff players in the country. 65% so far, 30 of 46 so far this season, but he's a kind of a man on an island. Now the Chase Keither, he's gotten a, a one draw, but that's it. Weirman's taken every other draw over Maryland's first two games here. Now Syracuse has a little bit of a two-headed monster between Mason Cone, the Tufts transfer, 47 and 61, uh, 77% so far, an incredible percentage, but he has he's played, you know, crap teams compared to Maryland playing Loyola and and um Richmond. Now they don't have they're not known for their faceoff prowess at this point, but still the defense, you know, you just they have more depth across every position group than the teams that Syracuse has played so far. So I feel like that's probably Cone's seventy seven percent is probably reflective of the talent that Syracuse has played thus far, but regardless, Syracuse fans are delighted to, at, at Cone's success. And I think this game is going to come down to those two position groups. What can Syracuse do at the faceoff dot? If this can be a fifty fifty battle, or if Cone can even come out on top. That's going to bode extremely well for Syracuse, especially against this tough Maryland defense. I think a key to Syracuse winning this game is to get at least a slight edge at the faceoff dot to give them that possession advantage that they're going to need to be able to put an, a couple extra goals past McNaney and this Maryland defense. So I think that the whole game could come down to that faceoff dot. But the battles that I would particularly watch, Maryland defense against the Syracuse attack. If you want to look at the other side, I don't want to front on Maryland offensively either. I mean, Maryland's got some killers and they've got some dogs. Braden Irksa is probably going to be a matchup problem. The problem so far with Maryland is they haven't really carried the ball effectively yet. They're just not gelling offensively. But like I said, Richmond and Loyola both boast pretty solid defenses. Richmond's defense, I believe, was in the top 10, and uh, Loyola's could be as well so far. So that could be the only reason for some of Maryland's offensive problems thus far. So I, I think how does Syracuse hold up against the Maryland offense? That's going to be one of the first things we want to see because that's like the, the less exciting matchup. I think a really exciting matchup is going to be that Syracuse attack in midfield against the Maryland defense. Uh, you know, the battle in cage between Mark and McNaney, the battle at the dot, between Cone and company and Weirman, all of those will be important, but I think they're important in the order I went in least to, to, to the face-off dot being one of the most important aspects of this game here. So my prediction, my prediction in this one, I'm allowed to couple mulligans every season where I let my heart 
make my prediction for a Syracuse game. So I'm going to do that here and I'm just going to lean into it. No logic involved. Syracuse by one to three goals. I think the Orange actually might come out hot in this one uh, and jump out to an early lead, only to have the the Terps storm back in a way that makes all of us Syracuse fans really uneasy. I think if Syracuse wins by more than a goal, it's only be going to be because of like some some type of late game garbage goal or whatnot. There's also that caveat I want to throw out. I do not think Syracuse wins this game by a margin. If Syracuse wins this game, I think it's going to be a very tight game. There is a world, I think, in which the Maryland defense could just be so good that it causes Syracuse's offense some troubles and that the Maryland offense doesn't have the same troubles, especially depending on how that face-off battle goes. So I think there's a world in which if Maryland wins, they could win by 3-5. to five. If Syracuse wins, I think it's going to be 1-3. One, one to three. I, I didn't even see the odds and see what Vegas put on this. Uh, because Syracuse is in my state, and I just didn't bother to look it up like a dumb shit before uh, the podcast. I'd presume Maryland's just about favored, but these teams at this point are you know are close enough that it's probably a coin flip. But I'm going with Syracuse as my pick, and I'm going to stick with that. And if I'm wrong, you got to give me the heartfelt mulligan. Uh, is what we'll call that here. Next game I want to talk about because I do this one isn't very intriguing to me for obvious reasons. Richmond in the past has played ACC teams in the early early season really tough, um, and and then they've already played Maryland tough, and then they kicked the shit out of who they kick the shit out of? Did they kick the shit out of Detroit Mercy? Robert Morris. That's right. They kicked the shit out of Robert Morris. So Richmond is interesting because at this point Maryland needed two OTs to take down Richmond in week zero. The Spiders then turn around, beat the crap out of Robert Morris, 23-7 to the weekend after. I knew Richmond was going to win that Robert Morris game, but I don't think a lot of people pegged them to win that 23-7. to That was crazy. Uh, their strength so far has been how effective their offense is. They're, they're the third, uh, third in the land as it pertains to offensive efficiency. Again, this is all according to lacrossereference.com. It's actually from the pro setup, so I'm not sure if you can even see all these numbers. Uh, their defensive efficiency rank is 10. Uh, they played a very good defensive game against Maryland, and then they kicked the shit out of Bobby Moe. So right now, Richmond's firing on all cylinders. They're playing good defensively. They're playing good offensively. Virginia, and then beyond that here, don't get me wrong, I don't think Richmond is beat UVA good. So while I'm propping up Richmond here and talking about the quality of their team because they are a quality team, uh, Virginia handled Michigan while not even playing great overall offensively. Now, that was largely due to the fact that Connor Schellenberger took 13 shots, only put two in the back of the net. He had no assists. Uh, but beyond that, what we learned about UVA is Schellenberger can play like shit, and uh, it's not going to matter too much, at least even against decent teams like Michigan, because Cormier goes for five and one. Jack Boyden goes for two and three. McCabe Millen goes for five. Both more than made up for Shelley's bad day. Are all three of them made up for Shelley's bad day? Uh, once again, I don't even know where I'm going with this, other to, other than to say Virginia's so good offensively that if you take away their QB, you're still going to get sniped by four or five other guys. Um, I, I, I am also impressed with UVA's defense and the way that they played against Michigan. I'm not sold on Michigan. Michigan lost enough talent offensively that and, you know, they brought some guys back. They brought in a couple of transfers, but they lost – Josh Zuada that was a big draw in terms of eyeballs that opens BAME up quite a bit more. I don't think they have two guys, the, the two guys together that they would need like they had last year to make that run. And last year, I think they played better defensively than we've seen them play so far. Hunter Taylor, you know, you don't know what you're going to get in cage. Anyway, I don't even know why I'm talking about Michigan. Uh, moral of the story, though, is even if Virginia doesn't play well, you're going to get beat up. Their defense played all over the place against Michigan. Um, I think the most impressive thing with Virginia so far in their their first game against Michigan was Michigan comes in with Wheatfelt and one of the best face-off crews in the country from a year ago, and they're back. Virginia loses Petey fucking LaSala. We don't know what they're going to look like at the face-off dot, and I, I figured even if Virginia got waxed at the face-off dot, they were going to win that game anyway. They were just going to make up for it, and the margin would just be a little closer. The truth is Anthony Gobriel, the Navy transfer for Virginia, he won 65% of his draws against Wheatfelt and the Michigan face-off crew that last year was one of the best in the country overall. So credit to him. And, and it's going to hurt for Richmond because they don't really have a face-off guy. I don't think they can play at that level. And uh, they actually have a bunch of guys here. Matthew D'Souza from Binghamton University also. I believe that's where he transferred from. Thomas Colucci. I mean, they have 
guys that can face off at Virginia and Richmond just does not. So I think that's going to hurt Richmond really badly in this game. And it's one of those things that separates these teams. It's like, hey, Richmond offensively, they could probably hang on a good day. Defensively, they could probably hang on a good day. Where they're going to struggle, though, is in the special teams, as we would call them. Face-off dot, they're going to struggle a little bit, I think, in the goalie battle here. Uh, that you know, Connor Knight hasn't played great yet. Matthew Nunes has played well. And, and, and the two defenses are not the same. So that's going to be a problem for Richmond overall. Now, my prediction here, as I've talked about this one quite a bit already, when you break def- – like, eventually Richmond's going to break. And when you break defensively against UVA, you end up losing by somewhere between five to eight goals, even if it's a close game. Once you break, they're going to rattle off three or four in a row, and even a close game can kind of become a little bit of a walk away. Uh, tough call still. I don't want to write Richmond off – but I still feel like UVA could absolutely win this game by 10 goals, maybe more. Um, but I just don't think it's likely given that Richmond's pesky. So I'm calling UVA to win this game by seven or eight. I'm giving it a five to eight goal spread by the end of the game. And I, I think that's actually me giving Richmond props in this one. I think Virginia is going to be scary good all year long. Uh, so I think stay, you know, for Richmond to stay between five to eight goals of UVA would actually be to, to some degree, a win, even if uh, they don't think so. So that's it about that game. That is my prediction. Another really good game here. We have number seven, Army, uh, uh, traveling to play Rutgers. Number 11, Rutgers. Both teams now are, are, are lossless. Rutgers at 2-0, and Army at 1-0. and For Rutgers, Ross Scott, he's their current leading scorer, five goals, six helpers. He's finished a rock at 45%. Jack, uh, I always forget how to pronounce his name. I always want to just call him Jack Amon. Uh, seven goals, Shane Knobloch, five and two. Dante Coolis, Canadian sniper, two and five. They can all hurt you badly depending on the day. For Army, Reese Burke, he's going to present some matchup problems. He put up a goal and three helpers in their season opening win. Uh, Jackson Ager and Jacob Morin both put up three goals. I think Morin, or no, a- Iker was three and one. I had a spell, spelling error that I literally just fixed on the fly as I was sitting here. Uh, Army, I think, is better both defensively and at the faceoff dot. Will Coletti, Will Coletti is an absolute beast at the faceoff dot. Uh, he owned the Drip King from UMass here, uh, Caleb Hammett. He also had a goal and a dish. So between the faceoff dot and defensive strength, I think Army does end up taking this game. But I like Rutgers' offense enough to think that they're going to be able to keep this close. And, and, and Rutgers actually brings in Cole Brams from Utah. Uh, both Brams and Suter so far have taken draws for Rutgers, so they're looking nice at the faceoff dot. I just think Will Coletti has that dog in him. You know, I think Will Coletti is an absolute animal, and I feel like he's going to have that slight edge. Even if he doesn't, I think Army's defense is, like I said, is a little bit better than Rutgers, a little bit more proven than Rutgers. Right now, both of them are wondering what the hell's going to happen in cage because both of them are you know, trying out new goalies here. So my prediction in this one... Army by one to four goals. And I think that if it gets to a four goal margin, it will most likely be because of a lopsided face off battle. Um, but I don't see that happening. I think this is going to be a, a very close game and come right down to the wire. These teams are rivals, they're regionally close. Um, so this should be a good one and a very interesting watch. Next one that we have to talk about is number 20, Loyola versus number nine, Johns Hopkins. Loyola's coming in at one and one. They beat the shit out of Georgetown. And then they uh, lose to Maryland. You know, not great. What was it, 11-4 or something in that area here. We got Hopkins, their opening season loss to Denver, but then they've beat Towson and then Georgetown after. So uh, between this game, one of the most fierce crosstown rivalries you're going to see, the fact that both teams have looked so good so far means this is a must-watch. Hopkins still hasn't played a complete game on both ends of the field, but they are 2-1. and one with a 13-5 win over Towson and that 11-9 win over Georgetown. Loyola has impressed with a stout defense and a high-scoring offense. Putting both of those things together is what you want to do. Loyola opened the season beating the shit out of Georgetown 18-10, and then they put up a respectable outing against Maryland 11-4. Not great overall, and I think Loyola would have liked a better showing, but still not terrible. Now, I'm still really high on Hopkins because I, you know, I just keep saying over and over again, they bring back everyone offensively, and that team hummed offensively last year. They bring back almost everyone defensively. They bring, bring in a very good veteran goalkeeper in Chase Erland, and that is, has been for a couple of years a, a problem. Last season, not as much, but in seasons prior, a problem in cage is just finding some true consistency there between the pipes. 
the, the my issue with Hopkins, or I guess the issue with this game is I, I see Hopkins eventually figuring this out, playing a complete game, and then from there on out, teams are really going to have to look out for them. My prediction for this one is Loyola is good enough offensively that they're going to probably put up 8 to 11 goals even against a good defense like Hopkins. The question becomes how can Pacheco at Loyola do against Callahan uh, at Hopkins at the faceoff dot? Pacheco's only won 39% of his draws so far whereas Callahan has looked much better, 60%. Tyler Dunn's barely even had to have any action because Callahan's been so good. So the face-off dot's going to be very important in this game, not all-encompassing or anything like that, but very important. So Loyola needs Pacheco to pretty much split his draws if I think they're going to have a chance in this one, uh, or I think it's going to be tough over the course of four quarters to keep pace with Hopkins. I think by the end of this game, we see about a two to four goal spread in favor of Hopkins. So I'm going with the, uh, with the Jays in this one, not going to be an exciting game. I don't think, but interesting at least as a, a good litmus test for Duke because Duke so far, they beat Bellarmine and high point. Now, Bellarmine's a, an improved team from what they can, they usually are. High Point has actually impressed, you know, since losing um, uh, Asher Nolting. I, I was surprised at how well High Point has played without him. But I think St. Joseph, J- St. Joseph's may represent the best team that Duke has played so far. The verdict is still out, but we'll see. Now, St. Joseph's, they did lose to number 15, Boston U, 14-10 in their only contest of the season so far. No crime in losing to Boston U. They're a very good team, and I think that rank of 15th in the country right now will hold up by season's end, and I wouldn't be surprised to see them you know, kind of rise in the rankings and maybe even threaten the top 10 as the season goes on. They have a very good team offensively, veteran-laden team all over the place. they got some things to figure out, I think, defensively, but Boston U is a very good team. So moral of that story. No shame in St. Joseph's losing to them by four. Uh, a season ago, and I've told you that these two teams' offenses were neck and neck in terms of like BU and, and St. Joseph's. But I, like I said, Dalto, Perfetto, Cates, and Bork for, for Boston U, they're just crazy. Uh, you can tell I'm, I'm a big Boston U fan because I'm previewing Duke and St. Joseph's, and I'm still talking about uh, Boston U. Only as a means to try to set up that I think St. Joseph's is a very good team, and I think that they could be scrappy in this game against Duke. Carter Page... 47 and 5, he's back for St. Joe's. Uh, Levi Anderson, 39 11, back for St. Joe's. Matt ba- uh, Bomber, 24 23, uh, he's back. They're the, the, the headlining returning scorers here. But after week one, it's Torin Eccleston that led the way with five goals for St. Joe's. Eccleston transferred from D2 Lenore Ryan, where a season ago he put up 57 goals, had 26 assists, 83 points, and scored uh, the Rocket on 37% of his shots. So, all important here for St. Joseph's. They got all their dogs back. They've added a transfer here. Where we're going to see this one um, go off the rails a little bit is going to be probably at the faceoff dot. I think defensively, St. Joe's has not faced a defense like they're going to see in Duke. Uh, none of these guys have seen a guy like they're going to see in Kenny Brower so far. They're going to Duke's going to win this game by a margin still. If St. Joe's can stay within, let's say, seven goals. I think that'd be a huge win for them. The reality is Duke's going to use this game as a tune-up for Jacksonville, Penn, Princeton, and Loyola. So Duke has some some really tough games that are about to come up. Thus far, I don't think they've beat the shit out of like teams like Bellarmine. They beat Bellarmine by eight. Uh, you know, I think that eight goal margin is not the best that Duke could have done. And I think that was kind of one of their tune up games. Let's figure some things out. Let's get some guys in. I don't think you're going to see, uh, what did I say here? One of my points was in Bellarmine, uh, 13 players for Duke scored. I don't think you're going to see 13 players score for Duke in this game here or in this game against St. Joe's because I think they're going to play the starters a little bit more. I'm not going to say they're going to play harder, but I mean, this game's going to have a different feel to them. It's going to hit a little bit differently, and I think they're going to come out and want to beat the shit out of St. Joe's, and I think they will do so. Uh, to the point that I think St. Joe's is a better team than Bellarmine, but you may see Duke beat St. Joe's up more simply because of where they fall in the schedule. Now it's not tune-up games. Let's get a couple of tune-up games under our belts, almost play them like scrimmages. Balls to the wall, but we're going to mix in a bunch of guys. We're going to mix in a bunch of different personnel. I think Duke's got the personnel figured out. They're going to run with it, and I think St. Joe's, sadly, is going to have to eat a lot of shit on this one. Uh, Zawada. Uh, Williams, O'Neal, Naso, Brower, all of these guys are going to be too much. St. Joe's is going to get a healthy dose of all of them, comp- you know, way more compared to what Duke's previous two opponents have gotten. My prediction, Duke's going to have 
10 point getters in this game because they're going to play a few less people. They're going to run the dogs a bit longer and the spread by the end of the game is going to show it. I predict Duke by nine to 11 goals in this one. Some of every, a lot of people are going to be like, how is that even possible? St. Joe's is a much better team than what they've played. But like I said, Duke didn't beat the shit out of the teams they played so far as badly as they could have. And I think they're going to take it to St. Joe's with everything they have. And I think that will involve a little bit more of running the score up on them a smidge, not in a bad way. But just in a way. And, and I mean, we're looking at Duke so far. Patrick Jamison has been solid in cage. Duke, this is what, like, look at all the goalies that have already played for Duke here. We look at the faceoff dot. Duke has a huge advantage there with Jake Naso. But you even look at these other guys who have gotten time. Gavin Ty uh, probably just not going to be able to hang. Gavin Ty, where'd he play? Was Gavin Ty a Virginia transfer? Maryland transfer. I want to say Ty might have played. Okay, he did play. He played for Virginia, Maryland, and now St. Joe's. So Gavin Ty, a little bit of a journeyman here. Uh, so yeah, my prediction, Duke by 9-11. to 11. I uh, take that to the bank, I think. No, don't. I'm, I'm just kidding. Don't take that to the bank because I'm an idiot. All right, Notre Dame. Notre Dame played last night, folks. I kind of watched the first half, and once the route was on, I actually thought there might be a chance that Cleveland State may cover the spread. So I took Cleveland State. Uh, at minus 14 and a half. And that did not pan out for me because uh, Notre Dame just came in and kicked the shit out of them. Not only did they kick the shit out of them, I don't know if I've seen this many dudes score in a game. Let's just count this here. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. We got 16, 17, 18 motherfuckers scored for Notre Dame in this game. That is an absolute rot. That route that shows you the depth that Notre Dame has across the board here. Pat Kavanaugh goes 0 and 5, Jake Taylor 5 and 0, Chris Kavanaugh 3 and 2. I mean, they just filled it up. I think one of the the big ones here though was Jordan Faison going 3 and 1. Notre Dame ran him like a dog. He ran with the first midfielders. They ran the offense through him. The dude is fast and the dude is really good at lacrosse in addition to being a really good wide receiver in football, Devin McLean, the transfer, he was 2 and 2, so yeah, Notre Dame offensively is going to be scary good this year. Mix that with a defense that while I don't think they're going to be quite as stout as they were a season ago, they're not going to be far off that pace and I I think that they'll actually be better offensively and they're already showing that. So, long story short, Marquette, they could be sneaky good. They have a 12-6 win over Air Force, a 16-5 win over Lindawood, which isn't that impressive, and they dropped uh, Detroit Mercy 22-8 to Tuesday night, wrecking my two-game parlay. I took Detroit Mercy to cover. took both teams to cover in that game. I think, the, the, I think who was it? Michigan played, and their team they played did cover, but Detroit Mercy did not cover, so I lost that bet. Uh, at time of writing, Marquette was ninth in adjusted defensive efficiency per lacrossereference.com, so they're playing decent defense so far. Notre Dame, after t- yesterday, I bet you they've bumped Marquette now because now Notre Dame's going to take that spot, so let's bump Marquette down to 10th automatically. Um so, yeah, uh, there's 12 teams that haven't played yet. So that's where I was talking about Marquette getting bumped down. Right now they're ninth. I don't expect them to be that. But they so far they got a top 20 defense. Uh, now, to bring things back down to earth, Marquette's only foe, decent foe is Air Force. Notre Dame's going to prevent a totally different type of test overall for Marquette. What my note says is here, Marquette's test in this one is going to be more like trying to take the SATs while six foot four gorillas try to bite your face. Uh, we're going to ride that Michigan quote as far as we can. And, um, yeah, so that's going to be totally different. Facing the Kavanaugh's, Taylor, Dobson, Entman, and company is going to hit much different than facing Air Force and and, uh, Detroit Mercy and shit like that. Uh, So my prediction for this one, uh, as I wrote it up, there's no line, but I like Notre Dame by somewhere between 7 to 10 goals. I don't think Marquette is a team that you beat by 10-plus on the road in your second game of the year, but look at what they just did to Cleveland State. I don't think Cleveland State's as good as Marquette, but... But we're going to see here. So I'm thinking, you know, seven to ten goals for Notre Dame. Uh, I think that if you smoke Marquette by ten plus on the road, something really bad happened for them. But if we look at like the goalie battle, they've played well in cage so far. Entman was a, a dog, eighty percent yesterday. Uh, Face off dot. They've played well so far, but Colin Hagstrom and Will Lynch are veterans, and they've been doing it for. Notre Dame now. They did it all last year. They're going to get to do it again this year for Notre Dame. So, yeah, I think it's going to be too much. They're going to outlast Notre Dame, and that'll be all she wrote. Now, Villanova, they started the season out 0-1. They're going to have to take on Yale. They lost 18-10 to, uh, to, uh, to Penn State. 
And Penn State's kind of, we got to bounce back after losing the Colgate game. So for this one, I don't have a whole lot to say because I didn't even watch the game. Now that we have this weird thing with Flow TV, there's going to be a lot more games that I don't get to see and a lot more teams that I don't get to see until somebody puts those highlights up and I kind of watch those. But what's going to hurt is I'm not going to be able to watch the team's defenses, see the team's goalies, because the highlights usually don't include that crap. So Flow TV is going to affect my ability to cover some of these teams, and I'm going to just have to go by box scores and shit, which I think is dumb. Uh, in this one, no, I like Yale. Uh, you know, Yale's got one of the best offenses in the country here. All these dudes are back. If we go back here and we look, uh, Chris Lyons back 62 and 12 a year ago, Matt Brandau, who I did not think there was a chance in hell was back. He's back 37 and 33. Now Brandau, you gotta, you guys gotta remember Brandau, I think was a 90 point scorer at one point in his career. And if not a 90 point scorer, he was their leading scorer the season before Lions and company showed up. You look at this season here, he had 99 points in 2022. Once you add Lions and company to the rotation, that dropped his point total. And actually, Lions ended up being their leading scorer a season ago, as we see here, Chris Lyons was. But then you got Leo Johnson's also filthy, 40 and 22. Bragg, uh, 19 and 7. I think Bragg's back as well. Uh, so, yeah, I think Yale's going to roll in this one. I, not, I don't want to say roll especially because Villanova is that early season Penn State or Yale killer. Um, so I think that Villanova will be pesky, but I, I just think that Yale is really good at lacrosse. I think that attack unit is filthy. I don't think Villanova is going to have the defensive prowess to hold them back too long. Um, and, and to boot, Villanova's only played a single game thus far too, so it's not like they're that far ahead of Yale in terms of uh, prep and all that stuff. So I'm going to go with Yale. I think it should be a decent game, though. I'm going to go Yale two to five goals, somewhere in that range, but Yale should win this one. Penn and Georgetown. Now, Georgetown is struggling. We have talked about them so, so far. They got trounced by Loyola 18 to 10. They got beat by Hopkins 9-11, played a little bit better offensively. Defensively, they're still struggling because even Hopkins didn't play great offensively. But I, you know, you could at least credit a little bit of that with the Georgetown defense. I think Penn overall is an interesting team because Penn is one of those teams that just keeps bleeding talent left and right. And Penn, if you guys all recall here uh, from a season ago, they're going to lose. They lost lose Sam Handley here, uh, so he's gone. But they do get back a bunch of other guys. You know, Ben Smith, Cam Rubin, those guys should all be back. So I'm going to go with Penn in this one, but I don't have a really strong conviction about it because Penn's identity has been so tied to Sam Handley over the last couple of years, and he's been that guy that when they need a, a game-winning goal at the end, he's got the ball in his stick, and he delivers often. So Penn has been one of those teams that wins a lot of close games, and you could put a lot of those close game wins on Sam Handley. And just the fact that they've got a guy with that type of offensive prowess, size, just the guy was a killer. So I'm going to pick Penn. I think it's going to be a dogfight. If they win, I think it's one or two goals. But in this one, I don't know what we're going to see out of Penn because it's going to be a little bit of a new look offensively without having a guy like Handley running around for you. TJ Haley played much better in their last game. Uh, Jordan Rays was good in their first game. You know, So we, they got to figure it out. Graham Bundy Jr. Had, has three goals so far, and they wish he had more. So, yeah, no, Georgetown's got to figure shit out. But the, the scary thing... For Georgetown here is if they can't pull this game out, they've got Notre Dame next. I don't see them beating Notre Dame. Brown's no slouch. They should be able to pick up a win against High Point Dartmouth for sure. But then they're right into Richmond. Providence isn't bad. Marquette's a good team. Denver. So even this year when Georgetown gets into their Big East schedule, it's not going to be like it was in previous seasons. I still like them to eke those games out, but they're going to have much closer games and a much tougher conference battle, I think. So in this one, I am going with uh, Penn by a small margin, one or two goals, but it, it it's, a, it's a coin flip, folks. Now, Penn State. Normally, you'd like Penn State against Stony Brook here, but Penn State dropping that first game to Colgate, and then you look at Stony Brook. They beat Sacred Heart barely. They play tight with Rutgers. Uh, I don't want to pretend I'm going to pick Stony Brook or anything like that, but watch out. Nick Dupuy, uh, at, uh, Dylan Palinetti, Blake Bellin, I think, is a transfer over from LIU. These guys can play lacrosse. They're going to be very good offensively. I think what's going to do them in by the end of this game, Frassian is probably the better goalkeeper, and he hasn't played great yet. He had a rough first outing, played much better in their second game against Villanova, 58% against Villanova, so he looked better there, was more tested in that game as well. Um, at the faceoff dot, Penn State, 
you know, Chase Mullins has been mediocre, but, you know, Stony Brook doesn't have anybody there. So I like Penn State by, you know, five goals, eight goals in this one, but it could go different ways. Stony Brook is a very good lacrosse team. Uh, they're going to do well within their conference, and they can, you know, maybe even threaten to make the tournament. I just don't think they're Big Ten Penn State good yet. It's just we, which team from Penn State is going to show up. Is it going to be the team that lost to Colgate, or is it going to be the team that won the following weekend and beat Villanova 18 to 10. If it's this team, the team that beat Villanova 18 to 10, forget about it. Stony Brook's going to lose. Stony Brook will lose by five to 10 or something like that. If it's the team that showed up against Colgate, it could be a battle and we might see a, a decent game in here, but I'm going to go with Penn state, you know, by three to five by the end of it. And it could be worse than that. Utah, Denver. I should have talked about this one earlier because, you know, Utah came into the season ranked, I believe, like 20th. They lose to Ohio State in their opener, but not badly. They came out and played well against Ohio State. And then Denver, as we know, they beat Hopkins and then they they barely beat Air Force. Air Force hung a little bit tighter with Denver than I thought they would. I believe that was partly because I believe against Air Force, uh, they were without Alec Stathakis. So for this one, is Alec Stathakis playing? Or is Alex Stathakis not playing? If Alex Stathakis is not playing for Denver, and wait a minute, I heard someone say that, but is that true? That's not true. Alex Stathakis took 17 to 24. I actually heard someone tell me, say out loud, I thought on Twitter, that Stathakis didn't play against Air Force. So I don't know, maybe somebody else didn't play. Did like Silstrop or somebody not play? Nope, Silstrop played. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, in the end, in this one, I like Denver. As long as Alex Stathakis is on the field, no worries for Denver. It's going to be a tight game. Utah will be pesky even without the Rock. They should be able to keep this a little bit closer than I would like to think that they could. But I'm still thinking Denver somewhere in the neighborhood of three to six goals. They'll probably pull this one out. But watch out for Utah, especially if they can do decent at the faceoff dot. If they can get a, a solid game out of their faceoff crew and only lose... 55%, it, that's probably not going to happen. Then I think that they can make a real game of this, but I think Stathakis is the real difference maker overall. Uh, Silstrop, the way he played against Hopkins, you get that dude. He's going to put up six points in the game. Uh, but I, I'm going to take Denver by a decent margin. Three three goals, maybe a handful of goals, depending on it uh, by the end of the day. Michigan. It was nice to see Michigan get a bounce back. You know, we had the shit talking that really probably wasn't as much shit talking as we all said because that interview was a ways before. The coach... Chose some words poorly, but that's all that really was. But Virginia took care of business, but they bounced back and beat Canisius 21-5. Ho-hum, they should beat Canisius 21-5. So Hobart, I think, presents a, a, a better test. Hobart played Colgate decent. Colgate beat Penn State. Penn State and Michigan are pals, uh, conference buddies. So I feel like this will be a decent test for Michigan here. Uh, at home, I think that they will beat Hobart, and they probably will beat Hobart by five to ten goals or so. But Hobart plays decent offensively. They got a face-off man who can mix it up. If we go back into this and we look at it, Adam Shea was 67% against Colgate's guys, whoever they put out. Shea's streaky. Shea will get you 67% in one game and then 40% in the next game. Wheatfelt has not played great yet, but that you would think would eventually start to fix itself. Uh, so yeah, I, I do like Michigan in this one, but don't, don't front on Hobart. They could keep it in more interesting than I think a lot of people assume. Uh, but I do think Michigan will slow roll it to a, you know, probably a five to eight goal win by the time, as long as Michigan plays like they're supposed to five to eight for Michigan, but don't front on Hobart. They could keep it more interesting than people think. The next one bought this, is, this should be a good game too. Both teams are still unbeaten. Bryant who'd Bryant beat in week one. Bryant beat Providence 15-3. to A lot of people are saying Providence has a pretty good squad this year, so that's a decent win for them. Boston U beat St. Joseph's in Week 1, and then they beat up on Vermont in Week 2. So both teams, not they haven't been tested insane yet, but it, you know, it should be a good game. Bryant always plays tough, but I am taking Boston U in this one. I think Boston U, they're better in cage so far here. Uh, I think they're going to be better, not better at the faceoff debt. I forget they have uh, Nathan Laliberti. Uh, for, or Lalibert, I'm going to call him Laliberti because that sounds doper, 63% in his first outing. And uh, Cal Calderon and Fritz, you know, still trying to figure it out. Actually, Fritz is 56%. So that battle will be important here. But in the end, I just think that that Boston U offense is going to be too much. Boston U offensively between Perfetto, Dalto, Cates, uh, Bork is back. And Bork's been quiet, just two assists so far. But I think he was their third, third leading scorer a season ago, maybe their fourth leading scorer a season ago. But yeah, Boston U, I think offensively is going to be too much. So I'm going with Boston U by two to four goals by the end of this one. I wouldn't be surprised if they spread this out even more than that. 
And now we're going to go in and talk about some of the games. I'm just going to make random picks here. I'm going with UMBC over Drexel. High point against VMI. Definitely going high point here. Mount St. Mary's, New Jersey Tech. I'm going with New Jersey Tech in this game here because they've surprised me already. We're going to go with them. I think Bellarmine over Canisius for sure. I think Binghamton over St. Bonaventure. Brown over Quinnipiac. I like Bucknell over Dartmouth. I like Carolina, obviously, over Fairfield. I didn't cover that one. Carolina didn't play great against Mercer. I, you know, they'll they'll win against Fairfield. It'll be interesting to see what that spread ends up being. I'm going with Lafayette over Hampton. I'm going with Hofstra over Siena. Offensively, Hofstra could be very good this year. Uh, I'm going to go with Holy Cross over Sacred Heart. That might be a mistake, but I'm, I'm trying to ride this Holy Cross wave a little bit. I think Manhattan's going to beat Vermont. I think I think Vermont, we may see a down Vermont this year for the first time in a few years. Princeton's going to beat up on Monmouth badly. Navy should beat Towson, but I think Towson will be pesky. Uh, LeMoyne's going to beat Wagner. Ohio State and Air Force could be a sneaky good game. I'm going to go with Ohio State. Uh, as long as Tommy Burke handles his business at the faceoff dot, they should be good. Uh, but that one could also be a, a closer game than we think. I'm going with Colgate over Albany, baby. Colgate beats Penn State. They beat Hobart. They lose to Syracuse, but it was a decent game, especially early in that game. So I'm going to go with Colgate over Albany here. Delaware is going to beat St. John's. Delaware offensively, very good lacrosse team. Mike Robinson, J.P. Ward. Uh, who else is back here? Yeah, I don't know. But Mike Robinson and J.P. Ward are enough. So I'm going with uh, Delaware over St. John's. I'm going with Jacksonville over Marist. I'm going to go with Merrimack over LIU. I'm going to go with UMass is going to beat the hell out of UMass Lowell. Cornell's going to beat Lehigh, five, eight goals, somewhere in that neighborhood by, I think, the end of it. Harvard's going to beat Providence. And then High Point is going to beat Queens. And I did talk about Notre Dame Marquette already. That's it, guys. Uh, we're going to probably, I'll probably mess around again Saturday morning and do a little bit of a stream Saturday morning, 10 o'clock. So be sure to tune into that Sunday morning. I will. I have not decided if I'm going to live stream Sunday morning show. One thing I didn't like about the live stream was I would normally be done at 11. And because I'm live streaming at 10, I'm not done until 11. And then I still have to cut some things up. So actually live streaming it, I thought was going to save me some time in the morning. But because I'm doing it at 10 o'clock, I don't end up start recording until 10. And then I have a little bit of busy work when I'm done. So I'm not convinced I'm going to continue to live stream Sunday show. But I think that I will continue to hop on Saturday morning and just have a bullshit session. Ideally, Show up. More people show up. More people can ask questions. Uh, I'll do less of uh, just me rambling about stuff. And if the more people we get in and the more people we get asking questions, we can kind of turn it Saturday morning at 10 a.m., the live stream, into kind of just more of a hang. I might even change the platform, and maybe we even get it involved. I could even do it on Twitter spaces where we could get more people on. And then instead of just me talking, we can get some of you talking. So please, in the comments, let me know for... Uh, Saturday morning show. Do we want to continue to live stream it on YouTube? Do we maybe want to move this to Twitter Spaces or maybe do both so that we can have more, a little bit more of an interactive thing with Twitter, Twitter Spaces and maybe get to hear some of your voices and all that crap? I mean, listen, a lot of you people that watch the show have been watching the show a long time. A lot of you guys that comment all the time comment all the time and you have insightful things to say. So I'd like to hear more from you people and maybe we move this Saturday morning thing to Twitter Spaces where we can get... It, it, I, I, I Probably fewer people will put eyeballs on it, but if there was 15 people in there all shooting a shit and talking about lacrosse for an hour before those games start, I'm all for that shit. So that's it. I'm going to shut up here. As always, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. You can always go to laxfactor.com, get swag there, support the channel. But really all I ask, share the crap out of this with your friends. Let people know what I'm doing here. Uh, come back Saturday morning, 10 a.m., quick live stream before all the games start, and then come back Sunday morning, 10 a.m., for the, uh, whether I live stream it or not, the show, the, the recap show drops Sunday morning at 10 a.m. So that's it. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And Hoost is out. The Lapse Factor Podcast.